Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to the July edition of Molten Music Monthly. Well, we're here in what is probably the hottest time the earth has ever known and it is steaming in my shed. It's like a flipping sauna in here and it's only about 10 o'clock in the morning. So I wanted to squeeze this out as quickly as I could before I wilt or melt or just burst into flames. And if you're here for the first time, you are very, very welcome. In this little video, it's only a few minutes, I bring along all of the latest news and interesting things in the world of music technology, synthesizers, software, all that sort of music making rigmarole that's appeared in the last month. And then if you have any questions or you want to talk about this some more, then join us for the live stream this Sunday evening at eight o'clock British summer time. And we can chat about it all or just make some music and generally hang out. So what do we have coming up this month? Well, Native Instruments give us a big massive kiss. Cubase gets ARA, ARA support. Focusrite release yet another generation of Scala interfaces. Crusher X blows our minds with version eight of their granular thing. Whereas Spacecraft takes granular in a whole other kind of easy to use and instantly accessible direction. Dopefer releases their slimline Eurorack modules. UVI finds some old Akai synthesizers that everyone had forgotten about. Bobo or Bao Bao is a super big Eurorack drum voice. Unfiltered audio has a frighteningly good synth. <laughs> I'm just really laying on the, the puns this month, I think. Spitfire, sample a 30 year journey around the world. Sketch can make you sound as crap as you did back in the four track days. And Folktech is about to release some of the most beautiful Eurorack modules you have ever seen. But first, the radiator, which is just what we need on a day like today from Neon Captain Radiator is a complete desktop laser synthesizer. Now, why wouldn't you want one of those? It's a laser synthesizer. It synthesizes lasers. You plug it into, well, you have to have an, uh, a laser projector, but you plug it into a laser projector and then it creates an awesome, I mean, I guess kind of Buck Rogers-esque laser show. <laughs> it's fantastic. It does the whole thing. You've got shapes and things spinning about. You control it all with knobs and sliders. You can get control voltage in there, modulation, MIDI, I think. I'm making it up now at this point, but you can get all these geometrical shapes going on, and color fading and phasing, pumping a whole load of dry ice, and you've just got this amazing sci-fi thing going on. I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that, but that's, that's kind of how it speaks to me. It says, wow, yeah, it could be Flash Gordon, it could be sort of 80s disco, 70s disco, it could go It could be a bit laser harpy, it could be Jean-Michel Jarre, it could be just stuff moving about on the wall behind you, fiddling around with the electronic equipment. I mean, who, who doesn't want that? I mean, it's been pointed out to me that there are already Euro rack modules that do a similar thing, and that's very cool. I would like to get into that. They're going to be out there who who makes those sorts of things and wants to send me a load of gear to try it, that would be fantastic. But this, <laughs> but this radiator thing also looks amazing. I think partly because of the simplicity or mostly because of the simplicity, because it's a desktop unit that looks like a synth. And so there's gonna be things there that I will understand and be able to play with. Now, apparently there's a bit of a story behind laser presentations in that back in the 1970s, it was an art form. People would have lasers and they would generate these performances live on the fly. Off you go, mixing things together, turning great big knobs and bits and levers. That kind of thing. And it became part of a performance. And then it kind of got computerized and it became automated and it just bounced along to the beat of whatever music you were playing. And it became this kind of slightly naff disco thing which was, you know, it was all right when you smashed out of your head and <laughs> dancing around on a light up dance floor, fantastic. But it had kind of lost its artistry. And so Neon Captain, the people behind Radiator, want to recapture that, want to put the control of that light, of that laser, back into the hands of creative people. So it's not just playing patterns, you're creating stuff, moving stuff, modulating stuff on the fly, like people do with, um, Resolume or 
or our chaos with video and mixing that into live performance. They're trying to very much do the same thing with laser. That sounds really interesting. I mean, partly because you don't have to spend your life trying to find decent video loops, either buying video loops or going out and making video loops. I mean, that's interesting in of itself. I mean, there's a whole artistry behind that, I'm sure. But rather than fussing about trying to get high quality video loops, you are creating patterns and stuff and visuals on the fly, electronically. And that, I think, really fits well with, you know, this whole thing and live performance and all that kind of stuff. So that's... That's a whole other thing I'd really like to get into. I mean, I did check out the pricing on things like laser projectors, and the first ones I came across were many thousands of pounds, and I thought, oh, well, that's that then. <laughs> I'd rather be buying a Moog One, thank you very much. But actually, there are some, I mean, I've no idea how well they work, for, for hundreds of pounds, 500, 600 pounds, and that might well do the job. I don't know. It's a whole interesting area that I've just not looked at before, and I'd love to have a play, because I do a lot of data production stuff. I do a lot of projection, video loops, all that kind of thing when I uh, are doing events and bits and pieces, and so that has always interested me. But I definitely see the, the different angle that laser could bring. Besides, who wouldn't want a laser projector and a dry ice machine? I mean, those two things are our dream bits of gear, I would say, for anybody. But anyway, the radiator is on Kickstarter. It's got a week or two left. They have funded, so it is going to be made, and they will cost about 749 Canadian dollars, whatever that is. Massive X from Native Instruments arrived pretty much as I was editing last month's Molten Monthly. So I wasn't able to squeeze it in, but we can squeeze it in now. And so we should, because it's a very exciting new take on the whole massive synthesizer architecture. What's all that about? Oh, I don't know. It's just a bunch of oscillators and synthesizer stuff stuck together in some kind of GUI that we'd like to use. I'm not explaining this very well. So what is Massive X and why is it exciting? Why is it interesting? Well, the original Massive was quite a, an innovative and detailed and complex virtual analog synthesizer. It was great because it gave such a level of detail that you could get some extraordinary sounds out of it. Extraordinary movement, extraordinary modulation. It was kind of a bit complicated. It wasn't easy to get into any depth with, but it did come with a bunch of really good presets. So anyone could give it a go. And you didn't really have to worry about how to patch or tweak or create your own sounds. Now, Massive X follows that vein. I mean, it's created by the same team who created Massive and they're not Actually, people in Native Instruments, it's kind of like their own group of people that have been developing this. And it's, and it's purely Native Instruments who look after them, if you see what I mean. But what they've done with Massive X, which I think is important, is first of all, they've expanded it in all sorts of areas. So there's different forms of synthesis, different ways of modulating things. And it's pushed the boundaries into kind of countless areas of sound design and interesting stuff. And the other thing that's important is that the interface is very much, it's not simplified exactly, it's just a lot clearer. You can see much, much better what's going on. You can access all of the areas and all the modulation, all the bits and pieces. And so ultimately it makes it a lot more accessible. So what is it exactly? Well, it's a dual wavetable synthesizer. You choose two ways. These can be classic analog ways or they can be complex waveforms that you take and you mix and you morph them together and that's your starting point. And then in a kind of a modular way you can plug in different filters, different filter types in all sorts of different places, different envelopes and different sorts of modulations and effects. They have filters for acid, they have filters for other forms of synthesis and styles and genres, they've got filters from the Monarch, they've got filters from all sorts of places. The list of filters is huge. And then it gets into the more complex synthesizer stuff like bit crushing and wave folding and ring modulation and other interesting things before then blitzing it apart with reverbs and choruses and delays and all that other good stuff. That sort of all exists on the top row of Massive X where you, you formulate your sound, your plan, you're gonna work it out as you go. Then in the bottom half, you mess it all about with the modulation section. In that bottom half, you have nine slots that you can populate with any sort of modulation you like. So LFOs, there's dozens of LFOs, far too many LFOs. And then there's a bunch of envelopes. And the envelopes as well have kind of 
far too many parameters and possibilities. And there's all sorts of stuff in there. You could modulate everything from everywhere. It's just completely bonkers. And that's not the half of it. The other half, or the bottom half, is the performer section. And this kind of takes sequencing or those, those ideas. I mean, many synthesizers these days have kind of performance controls within the sequencer where per step or per note, you can change different bits of modulation. So you have things essentially like a modulation sequencer. And the performance section within Massive X is essentially that, but it's different from a sequencer. You can draw in all sorts of changes and waves and modulations to be however you want it to be. Or you can select waveforms from a huge library of different things and then apply that to different parameters and have all that going on at the same time as all of the envelopes and all of the LFOs also feeding back in to the main synthesizer engine that you've created to just push every parameter into every possible direction you could possibly imagine. And then there's another little bit on the end called trackers, which is where, depending on what note you play and how you play that note, how hard, that kind of thing, that can also be fed back into the engine to create other bits of nonsense. So as you go up and down the keyboard, that can change how things are modulated and how things are triggered and, and so on and so forth. So did I say this was at the beginning that this was like an easier version of Massive? I didn't really mean that. It's massively complex. It's ridiculously complex and sounds, I mean, phenomenal. I mean, you should hear some of the Richard Devine stuff that he's done. Some of his videos on the sounds, you just go, that's totally amazing. However, there's one glaring kind of misfit within Massive X and it kind of affects how, how I feel about it. And that's that nothing is animated. The, the GUI, is flat and static. So what I mean is that uh, when you insert an envelope, take the envelope downstairs, you get a nice picture of an envelope, ADSR or, or whatever, and then you turn the knobs and the picture is just a picture. It doesn't actually move. You don't get a graphical representation of what that envelope actually is. So why is there a picture of it in the first place? I mean, if there wasn't a picture of it, then I wouldn't really think about it. I'd just use whatever values are on the knobs and go with that. But it has a picture, which makes you think, oh, that should move. And then it doesn't. And then you go, well, why doesn't that move? And then you waste a lot of creative time thinking, why, why don't they move? Hmm. Then when you take your waveforms and you mix those together, you don't see a visual representation of that. You just see the, the two original waveforms. You go, well, what, what, why doesn't that happen? When you modulate something, you throw something to a parameter, it, the parameter doesn't, doesn't move, doesn't give you any indication at all of what is actually moving that. I mean, you know, you have a color representation, this has gone to that, and it shows you that that is modulating that, but it doesn't animate it. I mean, one of the, the key advantages of any piece of software synthesizer is that graphically, it can be awesome. It can do all these things that you can't do in a piece of hardware. I can't have all these knobs motorized and moving about, it's just impossible. But in software you can, and you can show the relationship between things by the way things move. And Massive X doesn't have any of it. It's not there. So you're left with this very, very static interface while these amazing sounds and changes and movements and stuff is going on, but that's not reflected in what you see. And with a software synth, I believe you need that connection, the visual and the oral, the sound you need to have that there because you have no physicality. There's nothing you can put your hand on. And so you need visual feedback, I believe, to really get into that kind of thing. So I don't know whether it's because it was too complex. I don't know whether it was a design decision or whether it's something which is gonna come along in an update because they just needed to release the bleeding things that have been waiting so long for it. I don't know. But as it is with Massive X, phenomenal synthesizer, amazing sounds, masses of potential let down by a rather dull and static GUI that's largely unhelpful. And that kind of makes it feel a bit unfinished, I suppose. Steinberg have released updates for Cubase and Nuendo to finally, after all these years, include ARA support. ARA support. It's the support for running particular plugins within a track in Cubase rather than as a separate sort of hanging in there kind of insert. 
This is particularly vital for Melodyne. Melodyne is the big one. That's the one that everybody uses that they want ARA support for. Because, uh, you know, normally when using a plugin like Melodyne, you pull the audio out of the track, run it in Melodyne, do your bit, and then that kind of places it back in the track. And it gets a bit cumbersome and muddly. Whereas with ARA, it means that that plugin itself can run on the track. So you're working on the track within Melodyne rather than in a separate thing, if that makes sense. It makes sense when you use it. I mean, I've been using it in Studio One for quite some time and you forget how it was previously <laughs> because it just works so nicely and, and so seamlessly and it works exactly as you imagine it should work and should always have worked. And so that support there is now in Cubase and Nuendo, hurrah! And as if to celebrate, Steinberg decided to pick up Spectral Layers. Spectral Layers is a, oh, I don't know, a spectral display of audio. It allows you to look at the spectrum of stuff in lovely colory things. And to do editing on that's really good in sort of restoration and removing noise or troublesome bits and pieces. I'm not explaining it very well. But anyway, that supports ARA. And so you can run that in a track also. Now this was a crazy little find. It's called the Jupiter 3, or, or more than that. The J3DX. It's kind of an analog space synth, and we always like one of those. It's a lovely little orange box, a bunch of knobs on the top. Well, actually only five knobs on the top, a couple of buttons, and you just go to town, moving knobs, and it makes bleeps, and makes noises, and you just go, ooh, and there and back again, you trigger stuff. You know, it's not really the sort of synth that you play, necessarily. It's a synth that you, you engage with and just see where you end up after that. The original version used to have a little mic inside, a piezo mic, so when you tap it, it then created noise. Now they've taken that into a little external box, which is quite nice. You can like drum on that, tap it, hit it, that kind of thing. Because this is like uh, the 10th anniversary version of a synth that this guy was making. I don't know a whole lot about it, but it looked like a lot of fun. <laughs> So we have another generation of Scarlet interfaces from Focusrite. Haven't they got these right yet? I don't know, they keep fiddling around with these things. You would have thought it would have been perfect by now. But no, we have a third generation. What is that going to give us? I mean, if I remember rightly, the first generation were good looking, good value audio interfaces that suffered a bit from poor latency performance. The second generation improved on the latency greatly and kind of gave the look a little bit of a, a shuffle and make them appear modern, new and interesting. Third generation, they've now pulled in some of the stuff from the Claret range, most notably the air mode for the microphone preamps, which kind of gives them this, this extra, extra poshness or something, extra level of quality, extra sound, some kind of sound emulation from something or other. Maybe I should read what it says. Oh, that's right. It gives it that airy sound from those ISA mic preamps. And that's no bad thing. In fact, you know, the air mode actually on the Claret range, I do have a Claret uh, audio interface, are oh, excellent. It's a really great feature and it's cool that it's made it into their more budget area of audio interfaces. They are also USB-C now, so very you know, up to date on that. And as I understand it, the latency is even better than before. So, you know, nothing wrong with release. <laughs> so, you know, nothing wrong with updating your audio interfaces. There's a good range, everything from just one sad, lonely guy by yourself plugging something in up to recording whole bands. They are all in that, for me, rather annoying little one new rack sort of style form factor, but, but never mind. But they're good, they're good looking, they sound good. It's always good to see them working on the drivers to improve the latency, so yeah, good stuff. Crusher X version eight. Wow, no, I still don't have any idea what it's about. I keep talking about it and God bless them, they keep sending me copies to say, oh no, try it out, it'd be really good. And I keep meaning to, it's something I'd, I'd like to, to have a look at and get into, it's just, appears massively complex. Uh, this page of mysterious granular stuff that's going on, it's all about grains, it's all about speed and depth and density of fields and orientations and layers and layers of different grains pulled from this, um, you know, generally speaking when it comes to granular synthesis, I don't really, I don't really fully grasp it. I mean it tends to be a bit, you know, glitchy and bitty and bubbly and places and sometimes it's difficult to find anything that sounds remotely usable or musical. It's more of a sound bed of environmental spacey sounds, I suppose. 
but I don't really know what I'm talking about. But with version 8, they've kind of given it a whole other level of life. Because you can imagine that there are hundreds of individual oscillators, and they are like sample players living inside each grain. And with their grain modulation engine, they can poke at them, hit them with sticks, throw stones at them, and manipulate and twist them, break them, and destroy them, so that they collide into each other in interesting, crazy, granular ways. So ultimately, it's about smashing, <laughs> smashing samples together, I think, that produces grains, or smashing the grains, Together as you sweep through the, the granularity of the, the smashing and the, the modulation that that then, then reignites and then gives birth to a density field of, of grains through which you can, you can sweep and modulate and, and stuff. So yeah, that's, that's Crusher, Crusher X8, it's completely nuts. Now what isn't completely nuts is Delta V's spacecraft. This is something that I can grasp, I think. It's granular. Again, it's a dual granular engine. You've got a sample at the top, a sample at the bottom, you know, an audio file, top and bottom, that you sweep and get sounds out of. Very musical sounds, very interesting usable sounds, instantly usable sounds. And the only real editing you've got is a couple of different parameters with XY type controls, because this originally came from an iOS app on the iPad or on your phone. And this is a new version that's now been placed on the desktop as a plugin. And so it has a very easy, very touch-friendly, very finger-friendly interface. And that's brilliant, because that's what granular needs, because so often granular synthesis is, is mind-bending, like Crusher X is. And that's awesome if you're into that, if you want to spend the time delving into every grain and possibility of that, that's fantastic. I mean, you should go and check out, just to give Crusher X another thumbs up. Do you go and check out the video that they did, the trailer for it, because it's amazing. <laughs> the stuff that they can do with that is just extraordinary. Which brings you back to spacecraft, which is perhaps not as complex, not as extraordinary, but sounds really, really great. It sounds like, oh yeah, I'm in control of this. I can modulate this, I can add reverb, filter, I can swap between those things. I can morph between uh, different grains and different things and it sounds really interesting and it's working and I know what I'm doing and it you know it looks phenomenal I mean in a, in a Tron kind of crazy neon way but that just makes it I think more accessible somehow by restricting our access perhaps to all the deeper parameters that people like to use within granular synthesis it actually gives us something which is far more usable. All of the movement is sort of run by this sequencer grid which pokes around notes and grains and different forms of modulation. And as that's moving and messing through the grains, you can smear stuff and filter stuff and reverb stuff and mess stuff about. And then while you're doing that, you can resample the whole thing back in again and start granulizing all over that. It's great, it somehow made granular synthesis fun. I've had my eye on folk tech for quite a while. Now, they produce these extraordinary Eurorack modules, just works of art, and instruments too, sort of self-contained, strange, environmental, beautifully realised instruments. But they've never really done anything that's particularly resonated with me in terms of its functionality. However, now it looks like they've been working on a whole range of new Eurorack modules that they're going to launch in some kind of Kickstarter thing. Although, I mean, one of the slightly annoying things of folk tech, it's not annoying, maybe it's quirky, maybe it's endearing, I don't know, is that they have no time scale. They say, we're going to release this next month. And then three years go by and they go, oh yeah, no, we're gonna release it now. Uh, but we've changed it and it's completely different and it's not called that and it's now in red. But they essentially march to their own tune. So they have this Kickstarter plan, they can release everything in July. I think it was the 9th of July, and here we are at the end of July, and they don't seem to be any further forward as yet. But pictures have emerged, details have emerged, and they are beautiful. Beautiful works of art, these things. And rather than just being weird modules that do weird and crazy stuff, these are far more bread and butter, with a huge healthy dose of creativity and innovation and weirdness that we love folk tech for. They're also really good at the naming thing. So, the first one, 
is Rome, as in wandering about, I suppose. And it's an envelope generator. In fact, it's a dual AR envelope generator, which suddenly makes me think of the maths. It's like that. It's like the rise and fall section, two of them, from the Make Noise Maths. And that is pretty much all I ever use the maths for, as little envelopes and stuff. And it has all sorts of similar CV inputs and outputs. They also have these gold touch plates, which they really like. Just adds to the beautiful nature of their front panels. Next up is Sift, which is, it's a filter. Of course it's a filter, because you sift through things. How fabulous is that? It's a filter. And it's a filter which has lots of different filter types, as in types of filter within it, not filter modes necessarily, but filter types. Where you'd have uh, you know, a regular boring old filter. Then you've got one that stuffs noise into the cutoff. Another version which does square wave replication. There's an extreme resonance version. And then there's a version that just stuffs all of that together all at once. And apparently the gain control is at 100% when it's at 12 o'clock. Which means you've got a whole other turn <laughs> to push it into madness on the other side of that. And the other thing they've done is they've put a Vactral on the end, they've done this on a lot of these modules where it kind of turns it into its own VCA. So you have this added character of this closing and opening Vactral at the end of the signal. And it's gonna save you a whole bunch of module space. Then there's a big one called Anthesis. And this is an entire synthesizer voice that features two detunable analog oscillators that can either work together or completely independently. And you can fade between them and mix their waveforms. There's also a sub oscillator and a noise oscillator in there with a bandpass filter. There's an LFO and there's four envelopes for modulation. It's a massive sort of geometrically artistical mess of, of holes and knobs and, and routing and touch plates and bits and pieces. It's quite a, a solid looking slab of art. I mean, the one thing it's missing perhaps is a filter, but I guess they're imagining that you would pair it with Sift for all of that. Next up is Voices, which essentially takes the oscillator section out of the end thesis and stuffs that into a thing all by itself. And again, at the end of the chain, it has Vactrals over the output, so you don't have to plug it into a VCA. Next up is Fusion, which is a four channel VCA in case you're not using all those Vactrals or you have other stuff to plug in. And its special power is that you can mix everything together with a single knob. So as you turn this knob, the levels of the four inputs change and mix and morph from one to the other, which is quite interesting. And finally, there's Palaces, which is a reverb and delay module. Really good naming. I really enjoy the naming. And it's completely capable of just mad chaos and wonderful depth and stories which have yet been told. So all of this they're trying to bring together, I believe, into some kind of Kickstarter campaign and put them together as set systems. So you buy a number of the things together, which are already set up, ready to go as a complete system, kind of in a box. And that's definitely one approach to it. I also hope they'll be selling them individually because there has to be one that I'm gonna latch onto. It has to be one that I can, I can work really well in my setup. I'm just not entirely sure what that is yet. I can't wait to hear them in action to have a much better idea of how they would fit in an existing system but they're not likely to be cheap and they're not likely to be mass produced in significant numbers. So it's going to be getting in there quick, I imagine. And perhaps Kickstarter is the best way to do that because it does give us all a chance to have a look, to check them out and to pre-order. But this is definitely a new approach from Folktech, which I really like. Dofa has now released their Slimline module. These are nice weenie sort of 4HP and 6HP modules that you can build an entire synth voice with. The one thing that is missing actually is the synth voice, which is a complete little synthesizer in a very small form factor. But other than that one that we're still waiting for, all the other bits and pieces are there and ready to go. So it's a mini synth voice that's going to have the oscillators on it, of course. So the other modules are stuff that you would sit around that kind of thing. For instance, there's a random and sample and hold module. There's a nice little filter. There's a dual channel VCA. There's what they call an interrupting mixer, which I think is a cool name for reasons I can't understand. There's an even smaller narrow mixer. There's an LFO and there's a quad switch. So kind of in some way strange utilities, but useful bits and pieces. Dofa is always inherently useful. It's scattered all over my rack because there's things that they do that just nothing else does in such a neat and compact way. 
And the most expensive of these modules is the filter at 100 euros. Everything else is like 80 euros, 60 euros. Really very good value. So if you're looking to building a small, compact little Eurax system, then you're going to find some fabulous little bits and pieces within this slimline range. Uh, UVI like to sample stuff. They like to make huge sampled instruments of whatever they can find. Anything, any old rubbish knocking around at a skip, they'll take it out and they'll sample it. Well, the latest skip diving has produced an Akai AX73 and a VX600. No, I don't, I don't really know what they're about either. But these are apparently classic 80s analog synthesizers and you'll probably recognize them when you see them. I mean, they look like Akai gear, old classic. Akai gear, where they have bugger all controls, a tiny little screen, and a kind of creamy in colour. But remarkably, these two synthesizers were six voice of polysynths, fully analogue and pretty darn cool. So UVI have found one of each of these and have restored them all to their former glories and then sampled the, the heck out of them and produced this combined instrument called the UVX670. And it uses them together and apart. So you've got these two instruments sort of side by side, so you can just delve into one, delve into the other, or you can mix them together, which I think sounds a lot more interesting. I mean, they're famous for for the chorus, they're famous for the big pads that the VX600 was capable of, and I'm sure it has a very recognizable sound. And what I like about it is just that it's slightly different. It's not your usual synthesizers, it's a sample set of something which is just a little bit to the side, a little bit less out of the mainstream. And that's always going to be interesting. Initially in the GUI, you think, oh, all right, well, it, it, you would have thought they could have added a few controls rather than just stick to the very minimalist look of the originals. But they have, there's pages behind, which gives you a lot more access to tons more parameters. So you're not just tapping, tapping up and down, tapping up and down on a little LCD screen and then selecting a parameter and then tapping up and down, tapping down. So you don't have to do any of that. All of the parameters are laid out in further pages behind. Now ah, the Bow Bow from Quanalog Instruments. This is quite interesting. I'm always on the lookout for a decent drum module for my Eurac because I just I haven't sorted that side of things out yet. Drum solutions in Eurac are, are difficult, I think. You can end up getting multiple modules all just doing singular little noises. And that seems extravagant to me. It seems nuts. Anyway, the Bow Bow, or Bobo, or Boo Boo, the Bow Bow, who knows? This Eurac module is a nice big chunky one and it has, I think, five channels of sound inside it. And that's laid out in four sections. You have kick, you've got dual toms, you've got snare, and then you've got the hats. Now, sound generation is all analog. It's all based on filters. Starting off with a kick drum, which is a self-oscillating resonant filter. And that produces this thump of a sine wave that you use as your kick drum. And that sound is blended with a feedback click to give you that all important first transient hit. And then you've got a bit of control over the pitch of the sine wave and the tone of the click and how they blend together. So there's a nice bit of sound sculpting and tweaking that goes on in there. You can then apply three levels of compression and then you've got decay and an overdrive to push it into distortion. The low and high toms, the dual toms, if you like, sit side by side, use exactly the same sound engine as the kick but they're tweaked differently to give you a higher range and a lower range, or more of a mid range, I suppose, on the low tom. But this time we have CV control over the resonance. The snare, on the other hand, is a combination of white noise and a bandpass filter. And with this one, you have CV control over pitch and decay. And they've done something quite interesting where you can link the tom into the snare to produce or to add a bit more body to the snare sound. And finally, we have the hat, which is a noise source fed through a high pass filter. One other nice, feature of this machine is that you can use it purely for audio processing. You can use it in all kinds of filtering and noisy and shaping kind of ways. I think it's nice. I think perhaps it lacks a little bit of CV control overall, but there's there's a lot of knobs. There's just not quite so many patch holes to tie modulation in to those knobs necessarily, but it looks lovely, but I've yet to hear any demos of it. I love unfiltered audio. <laughs> well, at least the stuff I've played with, which is, no, I can't remember what it's called. Some delay thing, right? Some delay thing and some dent thing, crushing thing. Both of them fantastic. And fierce as well is what I like about them, is that you turn it on, it's and everything is screaming at you. And funnily enough, their new synthesizer is called Lion. Grr, Lion. And I can imagine that's exactly, that's exactly how that is. 
fierce. It's going to be in your face, it's going to chew your guts out and rip your head off. That's what unfiltered audio do really well. And with an interface, it's going to destroy your face as well. It's just going to melt your eyeballs out. Things going on, oh, this over here, over there. So, well, it's, it's a, some kind of virtual instrument, isn't it? It's got like 26 algorithms, <laughs> waveforms covering all the usual stuff you can imagine, plus FM and complex waveforms, and all that jazz. And there's two of them, and you can smash all those together. And then in a very modular way, because that's how they like to do things, they like to patch stuff about with these ridiculously thin patch wires on screen, which kind of adds to the, the zaniness of it. There's something about it that's angry you're not going to get a nice fat cable to draw in it's going to sit there and and like pretend it's under gravity when you move it about no this thin wire it's there it's sparky it's like rah <laughs> i don't know why it is i have this impression it's just it's just my impression of it so you have a whole different way that you can wire this up and patch it together. You can put the oscillators together, all sorts of weird sort of routing and stuff. You can then start bringing in other synthesis elements like filters and uh, effects and folding and crushing and beating and destroying and smashing their faces into the ground until there's nothing left. And once you're there, you then start turning on the, the biome randomization engine and fart everything around. So, you know, craft that perfect nuanced sound and then go and completely change that into something else so yeah i mean i haven't played with this yet and i mean to because i i've looked at it and i've read about it and i've written about it and it's like oh, i really must get into this so as soon as i can find some time i'm going to give that a really good play because it's just sort of the madness side of things that's really up my street it's all about four track cassette recorders these days i don't know why that is I mean, I, I cut my teeth on a Fostex X28 many, many years ago, recorded tons of stuff on that. And I still have mixes on cassette of stuff that I did on it that you can hear all the crosstalk. You can hear how as you layer up sounds and overdub, the sound just sinks away underneath. So you no longer know what any of that was about. And you end up with this kind of mush, this warm, distorted mush of something by the end and you wonder what was the point of doing all that work on the earlier tracks because you just can't there's nothing left nothing left of it but apparently we like that we like that now and uh we want to get back to it and so someone's come up with a with a plug-in that will make all your stuff sound like it's on a on a slightly dodgy warbling flanging four track cassette machine and it's called sketch cassette now interestingly just looking at the picture on my screen here it has that type 1 type 2 metal buttons nobody knows what they do i have no idea what they do you know you would you would buy i think a chromium cassette stick that in and would you switch that button i don't know it's like the dot dolby noise reduction you'd never turn that on because it would just make everything sound really really dull you know those are aspects of the uh, four track cassette recording that just boggled all our minds i think but I guess I'm really just speaking about my own experience. So what does this do? Well, it's kind of a charming lo-fi, hand-drawn, it's really nice actually. I think the interface itself is fantastic and it allows you to add in the elements that I suppose would mark a set out as in its format. Things like wow, things like flutter, things like hiss, for instance, saturation, dropouts, you know, all that kind of jazz that we try so hard to remove in our lovely, pristine recording environment. And so here we are doing creative audio degradation. Now Spitfire Audio are a little British sampling company who sample the most extraordinary things in the most extraordinary ways. I mean, orchestras and stuff and instruments and bits and pieces, they do all of that. And then they sort of stuff them in this engine which pulls them apart and does interesting creative things with them. So you get a pristine, orchestral sort of sound but then you get it screwed about with messed about with run through all sorts of weird analog gear and stuff and then you can mix and morph those between each other they just have a very creative approach to sampling which i really very much enjoy and now they've just released something called orbis now orbis takes the work of global sonic explorer or so he's called david fanshaw he's essentially walked the earth doing field recordings of music from everywhere, from everything, from everyone, from every place that you can't possibly reach. 
he's taken his battery powered recorder and microphone and recorded it for years, for decades. And he has thousands of hours of, of archive and Spitfire have worked their way through it in order to draw out gems and soundscapes and loops and bits and pieces in order to create this, I mean, sort of worldly and yet otherworldly instrument that they're calling Orbis. It's inevitably going to have an ethnic feel or a world music feel to it. I guess, but it doesn't have to. No reason why it has to. It's just an interesting sound source. And combining that in one of Spitfire's synthesis type engines where you can blend and modulate and move and articulate, then I imagine it's going to produce some extraordinary sounds. And finally, multimedia technology as a business has kind of quietly shut down our creative audio PC building side of things. That used to be the main business. That used to be all I did, building computers for people, building computers for studios, building computers for musicians and people all over the place. That was what I did. That's what it's been all about. That's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. But now Molten uh, as a brand has, has evolved much more into, into video making, into content creation, into writing, into that kind of thing. And so the building of PCs, which is very labor intensive and very expensive to run, has kind of taken a back seat and then slowly sort of slipped away. And that's okay. I'm very much enjoying what I do right now. And so what I thought I would do was create some videos about building computers because I've been doing it, as I say, for, for years and years and years. And I thought that that experience might be helpful to other people out there who are wanting to build their own computer and can no longer come to me to build it for them. So I put together a couple of videos on choosing components and introducing the concept of building an audio PC. And I've been completely flummoxed by the response. I mean, there's been a lot of good stuff and thumbs up. Great, that's fantastic. Thanks for that. But there's also been a whole raft of people going, oh, you don't want to do it like that. You want to do it like this. You want to use this. You want to do that. You want to do that. And I was, I mean, I must be an idiot, obviously. So I was quite surprised by the reaction because I don't know. I don't know why. I think I did. I have in the past spent a lot of time in computer related forums, arguing about specs, arguing about the things that work, things that don't work, what you should use, what you shouldn't use. And I, I sort of left that behind a few years ago because it was ultimately pointless. It would never really get you anywhere. And so I decided to just maintain my path, what I was doing. I knew what I was doing. I didn't really need to argue with people about it. And so I just got on with the job of producing really good, stable, awesome computers. And I'd kind of forgotten that world a little bit. And so <laughs> releasing videos on YouTube about this kind of thing certainly brought me back into that world of where we argue the toss over AMD and Intel and graphic chipsets and motherboards and RAM speeds and heat spreaders and thermal grease and oh. <laughs> and it's it's just been quite remarkable. I mean thankfully my attitude to these things these days is a lot more relaxed so I'm not instantly defensive. I'm still quite defensive because I, I do wish to defend my position and my experience and what I believe I have to add to this conversation. But at least I'm not doing it in a nasty way. <laughs> doing it in a relaxed, gentle way. And that's good. So why am I mentioning this? Well, only just to highlight the fact that these videos are out there. There's the first two of a series. Essentially, I've started in part one, introducing the idea. What is an audio PC? What's that about? What should we be looking for? Part two was about the specs and the sort of specs that you should be looking at doing. Now, one of the key things in this part two was that I didn't want to freeze it in time by giving a specific set of spec lists, a shopping list, if you like, because I don't think that's ultimately helpful because we all have different budgets, we all have different ideas and different products that are available and the products change all the time. So actually what I wanted to get across is more of a concept, more of an idea about what you should look for when you're buying something. And if you can stick within these guidelines, then I believe you can't go far wrong. That's the plan. A lot of people weren't really up with that though. <laughs> they want specifics, must be specific. And then the next video is going to be the actual process of building the thing. And then installing Windows and tweaking it and then testing it, making sure it's all okay. And then I suppose getting on and making some music or whatever you do once you have an audio PC 
I don't know, I just build them and send them out, so I've, I've no real idea. No, I mean, anyway, but what I think I might have to do is stick in another video, like an ad addendum video, just to further expand on exactly what it is I'm talking about. Because there's a lot of, people get themselves trapped in specs, people get themselves trapped in the technical bits and pieces around this, and so end up not able to do anything. You can't buy anything, because you just don't know which is the best, which is the best, should I get this, should I get this? I just don't know, I don't know what speed of RAM to get, oh, I don't know, oh, should I get the i9, or the i9, or the i7, or should I get that i7, or is it this, is it the K, is it the X series? Ah, oh. so, <laughs> uh, uh, people, as I say, get trapped in these things, and there's no answer to any of that, there's just somebody else's opinion on what's good and what's not. So. I think I might bring in another video just explaining a little bit more and perhaps pointing out some specific specs and why I think those are important and why I think these other things are not important. Because what ultimately I want to get across is that the specs are unimportant. I know that's controversial, but that's honestly how I feel about it. Having built computers for studios for 20 years, not just building computers for myself, I'm building computers that I sell as a business. And I have to be able to deliver a computer which works out of the box, which can arrive safely, will always work, is reliable and easy to support. That means it's not necessarily going to be the absolute cutting edge of something because that brings in all sorts of doubt and uncertainty and unreliability. I don't want that. Who wants that? You have to aim to spend a little bit more and to get a little bit less than absolute cutting edge. And that's a really hard concept for people to accept. I think. But it makes a lot of sense. I promise you it makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to possibly work in another video explaining that a little bit more. We can also talk about it in the live stream because it's, it's something that people like to argue over and I'm quite happy, quite happy, quite happy to do the Intel AMD argument, the Mac PC argument, whatever argument. Very happy to because I am just really safe, safely set in my ways as far as a being a, a computer builder goes because I've done it for so long you know it's not something that I fuss or worry about anymore anyway so I just thought I'd update you on that so before I melt completely because I've nearly had it I think now what do we have coming up well off the top of my head more synthy stuff more synthy, wizardly sort of stuff, more DIY projects I've got coming along very soon. Uh, I'm still awaiting the Deckard's Dream parts to arrive before I can even start on that sort of build. But I want to build a couple of other kits first in order to practice. To practice not only building kits and soldering, but also to practice the filming and setup of it because the, the last DIY project I did a couple of weeks ago the filming didn't go quite right. There's lots of issues with getting my head in the way and all that kind of thing. So I want to work on that a little bit. I also want to work with my six synthesizers that I've got, the little mini synths to see if I can do a little bit more with that, some music making with all of that. And I really need to look into getting some kind of drum machine. I don't really know what to do about that as yet. As I say, I'm always looking to try to work out drums in the Eurorack, but also having a little drum machine of some kind might also be useful. I don't know. In terms of reviews, I have all of those six synthesizers to review. I've also got a lovely Panorama controller keyboard from Nectar. I want to get back into doing some, you know, shorter, smaller reviews of software synthesizers because I seem to be neglecting that a little bit. And I have the fabulous Erigosynth Black Stereo Delay that I'd like to do a review of. So yeah, loads more great stuff to come. So assuming that the Earth hasn't burnt to a cinder, then this Sunday at eight o'clock British summer time, we will do a live stream. We'll do it. We'll, get, we'll sit here, sit here. I'll get a beer. Although, funny enough, I'm off the beer at the moment, so maybe it'll have to be bourbon. Some kind of drink, anyway. We'll sit here and chat about stuff. Chat about audio PCs, chat about synthesizers, music tech, make some music even. Who knows, that kind of thing. You are very, very welcome to join us. You can just hang out and watch what goes on, or you can contribute, you can ask questions, comments, and I will try to answer as many questions as I possibly can and get into as many confusing conversations as we can. Usually last for an hour or two from eight o'clock. Join us at any point and it'll be fun. Let's do that. So that's this Sunday, the 28th of July at eight o'clock. That's great. Thanks for joining me. I hope all of that was helpful. Now go stick your feet in a bucket somewhere and relax and chill out. 
like, subscribe, share the video, all of that sort of thing's helpful. Come and join us on Patreon, throw me a couple of dollars just to keep on keeping on what we're keeping on keeping on. And until next time, go make some tunes.